Ready to start then? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, welcome everyone to our program on classic cars. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Hi Westerly Historical Society. And this is our second event this fall. Our first event was submarines, second is classic cars, and third event will be planes. So we've really had the gamut this fall. It's been a lot of fun. The classic cars outside are phenomenal. We're so excited to have them here and have these gentlemen here to talk to us about classic cars. I'm going to let Bob introduce himself and we'll start the program. Thanks, Pamela. Um, my name is Bob DeGorzi and I'm here with Ken Carr. We're both members of the Westerly Pawgatuck region of the AACA. It's a local AACA club. Um, the club has been in existence f since 1965, and we currently have a membership of about 45, uh, 45 people. Um, and we're a very active club in the region. Um, and we're always looking for new members if anyone's interested. So um, what I wanted to do today is we, both Ken and I split, split the lecture up. Uh, I, and neither one of us are prof professional season lecturers, so please take that keep that in mind uh, when we make the presentation here. Uh, my last lecture was about 15 years ago, so uh, a little rusty. Um, but what we're going to try to do today is uh, give you the history of the automobile in America. I'm going to cover the years prior to World War II, and Ken will pick it up after World War II. Uh, all right, um, so let's... If we can start. Uh, I don't have it. Are we not? Yeah. Is that little chip? Oh, we forgot a chip, huh? Well, yeah, we got to plug it in. You know? Okay. Okay. And I figured we'd start back at the beginning. Uh, this is quite a ways back. Um, but you can bet that even when the first cars were made in America, there was some pretty heavy wheeling dealing about how to sell them. Uh, maybe not quite like this, but uh, uh, there was uh, the auto industry began with hard sell way back in the beginning. Uh, and really starting, starting in America, the beginning really started uh, in the late 1800s, but prior to that, um, there were other advances in the Industrial Revolution that made accommodation for the engineering to be able to build automobiles. Um, the electric motor, uh, there was work on developing electric motors as far back as the early 1800s, 1820s, 1830s. Um, and in the early years, there was a competition primarily between steam power, electric power, and the internal combustion engine. Um, the internal combustion engine was really designed in Europe. Um, it was patented by a man named, the four cycle engine was patented by a man named Selden in the United States. And does everybody know what a four cycle engine is? Uh, the, the car you drove to here today has a four cycle engine in it. Intake, uh, compression, ignition, exhaust. And when I say ignition, the engines that you drive today are really uh, more technically called spark ignited engines. It requires that fuel be compressed and that, it, that, it, and, and that a spark be created with high voltage to explode in the cylinder and push the piston down. So you're really driving a spark ignited engine when you drive here. Um, so in the early years, and this was around the late 1800s, 1880, 1890, um, there was this competition between electric uh, uh, steam and the internal combustion engine. And eventually, and, and steam carried all the way through the 1920s. Um, you've all heard of a Stanley steamer. One of the disadvantages of steam, of course, was the fact that you had to get up ahead of steam. And you could not go out and start a car like you do today and take off. You had to prepare that car. You had to, you had to get the fire going in the boiler to be able to, to power the car. Uh, that's a significant disadvantage. Uh, and, and that's probably the, the death knell of steam. Um, although it created great power, once you had that boiler started, it created great power. In the 19, um, 
I think it was 19, where did I have the date? I think it was like 1917. There was a steam car that actually uh, uh, was able to achieve 127 miles an hour uh, in that, that, that time, unbelievable. Um, so really, um, the railroads developed steam, the railroads perfected steam. It worked fine uh, because you had these immense steam boilers. Not so good in a car, although if you had the patience to be able to operate a steam car, it was, it was a pretty reliable and, and pretty fast mode of transportation. What we're going to concentrate on is the one that finally won out, uh, is, and, and is uh, the internal combustion engine. Um, around the turn of the century, the main competition, although there was steam, the main competition was between electric cars and the internal combustion engine. And electric cars, at that time, were very expensive to produce. Uh, and the turn of the century and into the first d couple of decades, an electric car would cost a th a th 800, 1,000, some of them cost as much as $3,000. Uh, they cost more, as much or more than houses. Uh, so uh, the battery technology wasn't developed. There was high, a high cost of, the, um, of the developing the cars, and eventually they did lo lose out also. Um, the internal combustion engine, as I said, was really designed in Europe. Uh, a fellow by the name of Otto was a guy that uh, developed this four-cylinder and he was associated with Daimler uh, Benz, uh, Mercedes Benz, eventually Mercedes Benz. But that auto four cycle engine was one, the one you saw in a lot of the early cars. Um, one of the ways that the manufacturers of the early cars were able to get notoriety were to enter into races. Uh, they rented, entered into races and they entered into endurance contests. Um, some of those early races took place even locally, uh, and I've got it here somewhere. Old Narragansett Park, Cranston, Rhode Island, 1896. There were electric cars that were running, winning those races in Narragansett. Uh, 1901, Gross Point Track in Detroit. Um, uh, there was a race between F Ford and Winton, and Ford won. Uh, in order to get attention for his cars, um, Henry Ford entered a lot of races. Um, and uh, that's the way he was able to get attraction uh, from the public to be able to, to uh, showcase his cars. Um, there were other races. Uh, the Vanderbilt races on Long Island took place for many years. And in the early years, you've got to remember in the, in the late 1800s, we were still a, a society that was primarily traveling by horse. Uh, longer distance travel was, was uh, uh, railroads, but we were traveling by horses. We were also occupying the cities, and those urban areas had a problem. You had so many horses in some of the cities that you had a problem with the poop. And they, 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 they created uh, tremendous pollution problems, uh, and people wanted to get around faster. Although in the early cars, uh, when they were, were first manufactured, the average person didn't know what to think of them, and they, they certainly couldn't afford them. Um, Henry Ford was the man that, that revolutionized that. Um, and he actually created, uh, his first car was called the two-cylinder job, and that's one of his early cars. And if you look at that car, look at the size of the wheels on it. Look at the simplicity of it. It was a, a, a two-cylinder engine, four-cycle engine. Uh, what do you see missing on the car? Steering. No steering wheel. Uh, steering wheels didn't come into, uh, uh, become in vogue in cars until about 1900, and Packard was the first company that actually um, brought them in vogue. Um, what else do you see or don't see? There's, n there's nothing around the driver. You don't, have, you don't have an enclosed car. You have an open car open to the elements. Um, you've got, and this carried on through, through the 1900s all the way to the 1930s. You had a straight axle in this car, which means that front axle was, the front wheels were connected by an axle. When you went over bumps, this thing, this thing was rough riding. It would bounce all over the place. Um, and you had a very simple transmission. Uh, in this one, I'm not even sure if you had gears that you could shift. Uh, the later cars where you had gears that you, were, you could shift, um, there were no synchromesh transmissions. Very often you had to double clutch the car to be able to shift from one gear to the other. Um, no lights. Uh, so, and Ford is touted as the first person to really um, revolutionize car production with the assembly line. 
And actually, he isn't the first one. Ransom E. Olds was the first one, Ari e. Olds. Uh, and he did that with this car, the Curved Dash Oldsmobile. And he created an assembly line and produced, I think, uh, about 2,000 of these cars. This predated Ford. Ford didn't get online with, uh, uh, with an assembly line. I believe it was 19. Uh, I have to look up the dates because I can't remember them myself. Um, 1914, he started. And that actually uh, was later than uh, when the Model T came out. And the Model T was the revolutionary car that Ford built. And it wasn't, didn't go into an assembly line. It came out in 1909, didn't come to, into an assembly line until 1914. What was good about the Model T? Um, and I don't, I don't have a picture of a Model T, I don't think. Nope, but a similar car. I'll say something about this, and that's actually a steam car. Um, the Model T was a car for every man. Uh, it was a simple car, it was somewhat crudely built, but it was reliable, it was cheap, there were parts available, it was repairable, and it was produced in the millions. By the time the Model T went out of production in 1926, it had, Ford had produced over 15 and a half million Model Ts. 15 and a half million. They were virtually on every corner. So uh, it was a car that a farmer could afford, that a, a factory worker could afford, that just about anybody could afford. At the, at, I think the lowest they sold for was about $345. Uh, they started out much more expensive. They started about at six to $800. And through the uh, assembly line, he was able to bring the price down significantly. So that's the success of the Model T. And, it's, and in its six best years, it accounted for 50% of the sales of, the, of cars in America. Okay. At the turn of the century, and, and you can look at this, uh, at the turn of the century, there were approximately estimated between 1900 and 1920 or so, and I've got a chart over here that can show you some of this. It's, there are estimates as high as uh, 4,900 automobile manufacturers in the United States. That particular chart talks about 2,600. Um, virtually, and, and most of those um, uh, shops began uh, either as a, a wagon, uh, wagon manufacturer or bicycle manufacturers. The, the other non-powered mode of transportation turn of the century was bicycles, of course. A lot of those bicycle shops um, got the idea, well, we're, we've got these two wheels and maybe if we put two bikes together and put a motor between them, we can get going uh, and go down the road a lot faster. So a lot of those initial, and you'll see some of those up there, a lot of those uh, initially um, started as bicycle shops. And the one that started in America that was basically the first manufacturer of automobiles or the first successful car that was built was built by the Durier brothers in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and I, I, didn't, I didn't put one up there. Um, and it was sim pretty much similar to that. It was called a quadricycle and it was pretty much similar to the car you saw that Ford built. Um, so, uh, and that started it all. That started it all. That first car in 1895 started it all. Um, again, if you look at some of these cars, this is one probably from the, and I don't have any specs on this, um, this is a, a steam car, uh, probably from the uh, 19 teens. You see it is a little bit different than the one Ford was driving. There's a little more structure in the car, the wheels are a little smaller. You actually see a steering wheel. Still, you don't see any ca canopy or, or cabin over the car. Um, this was still a, a very crude proposition going down the road. And the roads at that point were terrible. Um, uh, there, we didn't have any federal support for road construction. Uh, and more often than not, roads were not roads. They were paths of uh, horse paths that were converted to, to travel by car. So um, very, very crude. And if you look at the dash of one of these, you see it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, you'll often see these cars referred to as brass era cars. A lot of the, um, the uh, hardware on the cars was made out of brass, uh, and a lot of it was not made by the manufacturer. A lot of it was added after, uh, after in the aftermarket uh, of lights and, 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 and whatnot and horns. Um, and you can see that it is a very simple, open, scary operation to be riding in one of these cars. Okay. Uh, one of the, one of, and one of the, you've probably seen this in a lot of, and I mentioned, I mentioned uh, people, uh, the manufacturers trying to get notoriety from their cars. G 
just a couple of noteworthy uh, examples. The first Indianapolis 500 was won by a, um, a man by the name of Barney Oldfield. He was a very famous race car driver and he won in a Winton, okay, uh, which went out of business not too soon, thereafter, too far thereafter. The great race occurred, in, and that was 1909, the great race from Paris uh, um, to New York occurred in 1908. It, tr uh, it was 13,000 uh, miles, it took 160 days, and a Thomas Flyer won that. You've probably heard of a Thomas Flyer. So um, th those races were of great notoriety. Um, and I forgot to mention one that the, uh, the Duryea brothers actually entered, and this was in 1895 when they first created that car. They entered a, uh, a, a race where they beat a Daimler Benz in a Sturgis electric car. It was a 52 mile race. Uh, they, they achieved a breakneck speed of about five miles an hour. Uh, the, this 52 mile race took eight hours to complete and it included two and a half hours of downtime to repair the cars. So that gave you some idea of the reliability of those early cars. Okay. During the 20s, and this, is, this, is a, uh, this is actually a 32 Chevrolet, but as the cars um, became more sophisticated. Uh, here's a good example of what you see. Uh, you see an enclosed car. Um, it's still, uh, in this one I believe it's a solid axle, but you see an enclosed car. You saw better brakes. And um, you still had the problems of, uh, when you started a car like this, uh, you had a throttle control. You actually had to advance the spark in the car. You had to retard the spark to start it and then advance it. You had to choke the car. Uh, you were much more connected to that car. You had, to, you had to understand how the car operated and you had to be willing to invest yourself into how to, how to do all these things to make the car run. As time went on uh, and cars became more advanced and more sophisticated, a lot of those things uh, didn't have to be done. Okay. And during this time, uh, there were some significant uh, improvements in cars. One of the most significant was uh, uh, designed by a man named Kettering in 1912, which predated this quite a bit, but I should mention this because it is significant. Um, this man Kettering developed for Cadillac, and Leland was the man that uh, started Cadillac. He developed an electric starter. The earlier cars, in order to start the car, you had to get up and you had to hand crank, this ca hand crank the car over. And many an arm was broken when that uh, car might have uh, 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 bucked and reversed, reversed itself because of the compression of the engine and uh, arms were broken. It was revolutionary in 1912 to have an electric starter in your car. Uh, boy, do we take these things for granted today. Um, during this time also, uh, going, really going back to the first slide, uh, I've got to make sure i got... During this time also, there were so many manufacturers and a lot of the names that you hear today are, are, are um, developed during this time. Chrysler, there was a man by the name of Willie Durant who started General Motors. He was actually fired by General Motors. I think he was rehired twice uh, before he finally um, brought General Motors into the forefront with the, the five different models that they produced. Leland who developed the um, um, the Cadillac, um, Henry Ford, the Dodge brothers. The Dodge brothers worked for Ford uh, and they eventually left and founded their own company and eventually were, were bought out by Chrysler. Um, so there was a lot, of, a lot of give and take during that time with a lot of these manufacturers and engineers trying to jockey for position to find a, a, a car that they could sell to the public, that they could develop and they sell. I would strongly encourage you um, while, while we're here uh, after the lecture to go up to this chart and you can see the evolution of some of these ca car manufacturers about uh, how they, when they developed, how they developed and who they were dealing with to develop, to, to be, develop the different uh, models of cars. So uh, that's a very complete chart. It's amazing what the man did to produce that chart. It gives you a very clear picture of the history of the automobile in America from, from the beginning to about the 1970s, I think, 1980s. Um, 
one of the significant, uh, and, uh, and this, is, this is before that occurred, but it was the early part of that. I'm gonna show you cars from the early part of the 30s, and, and the 30s are my favorite decade by far. The early part of the 30s, and they are still fairly crude. Um, you didn't have independent suspension. You didn't have synchro mesh transmissions. Many of the cars were, in the early part of it weren't even enclosed. Um, you, you, you didn't have uh, um, good steering in the cars. You didn't have good brakes. Most of the brakes in these kinds of cars in the early part of the, the 30s were mechanical brakes. You stepped on a lever which pushed something against the wheel to stop it. Um, they were not hydraulic as they are today. Um, by the end of the decade, those, those technologies were developed. You had hydraulic brakes. You had wonderful steering in the cars. You had good rubber. Uh, usually in the 20s and 30s, when you went out in a car, you brought two, extra, two or three extra tires. If you went on a 50-mile trip, it was almost guaranteed you were going to have to change a tire. Um, that's how bad the rubber was at that point. Um, also, during the 30s, it became... Uh, uh, the, the technology was developed that those cars, and you see them out in the yard today, there are 36 cars out, in, uh, 30 spinach cars out in the yard, they drove almost as well as the ones we have today. Maybe not quite as fast, not quite as smooth, maybe not quite as quiet, but they were pretty darn good. And, and this was in the 1930s. Okay, and another thing that you saw in those 30s cars, there's a Ford, uh, 20, uh, late 20s and 30s cars. Um, we've got an encased car, but it's still a pretty basic car. The windshield's flat, you've got running boards on them, you've got spare tires on them, and in some cases you had rumble seats in the back to carry extra passengers. Um, one, of the, one of the things that developed during the 20s that was significant is we started to, de to develop cars not only as utilitarian uh, objects to get us from one place to the other, but design was important, began to be important in the cars. And design is often um, driven by what's going on in the world around us. Um, and the, a lot of the manufacturers would look at world events and they would, they would try to incorporate some of those things that were going on during, during the, that time into their cars. One of the significant events in the 20s was in 1922 in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, uh, King Tut's tomb was discovered. Okay. That's it. No. no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Ken. I, I was under this impression too. Uh, I thought that uh, Steve Martin did discover King Tut's tomb. <laughs> but in, in fact, he didn't. Uh, it was a man by the name of Howard Carter, and he was a British archeologist. Uh, what was significant about King Tut's tomb and the thousands of art, of relics that were uh, brought out of this tomb. It created a worldwide frenzy for things Egypt. And it even got to cars. Uh, this is a, a, a 20s vintage, a late 20s vintage, Stutz, and that's Ra. Um, he is a, a, I guess, I don't know what Ra was, I guess he was the god of the sun or something like that. But those, um, those things were incorporated into the cars. Another thing that happened in the, in the mid-20s was the Paris Art Show in 1925. And during that show, they introduced a new style of design. Uh, a lot of people call it Art Deco. Uh, it's more correctly termed Streamline Modern. And what that did, uh, the designers went wild with it. And here's one of the classic cases of uh, that design at, 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 at its, the epitome of that design. With, with chrome and uh, a lot of uh, chrome accents in a car. This is a Duesenberg, and it's probably one of the, one of the most uh, tremendously engineered cars of its day. Auburn, Cord, and Duesenberg. It's a mid-30s mid cars. When you bought an Auburn in 1935, often you got it with a little dash plaque on it. And that little dash plaque uh, attested to the fact if you bought a supercharged car, and this was a supercharged car, uh, Duesenberg J, uh, that attested to the fact that that car had been driven at the, the Auburn factory over 100 miles an hour. And this was in the mid-30s. That car was tested at over 100 miles an hour. Um, unbelievable. Um, if you love cars and you love design of cars and you love the way, uh, and, and there is no other, in my mind, there is no other era better than the 1930s 
that exemplifies how the designers took uh, function and form and mated them together into things that are beautiful. Uh, and that's what some of these cars are. Probably the, the Duesenberg and probably one of the most beautiful cars of the era was the Auburn Boattail Speedster. Um, just, just a tremendous car. And these are cars that we laugh today, we say our cars are better. Um, our cars are not going to be around 100 years late from now. These cars were built and they're virtually indestructible. If they're maintained, they're virtually indestructible. The engineering was so good in these cars that they, they can be run today. I'm sure there's somebody out there that owns an Auburn like this that's taken it to 100 miles an hour uh, because the cars were so well built. So, uh, just tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Okay, and I'll, I'll try to wrap this up because we're, there's two of us and I don't want to go, go on too long. One other thing I wanted to mention, and especially about the 30s, and especially being in Westerly, Rhode Island, um, there were a lot of publications, and I brought, I brought a bunch of publications in. Some of them date back to the 30s, some of them are the 50s, some are more recent. Some are uh, 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 new magazines about old cars uh, or how to restore cars. Um, this is one of my favorite m magazines, and this was, began production in 1900. It's called Motor Magazine. It was a trade magazine for for automobile, uh, all things automobile, uh, uh, back at that time. So this is an 82-year-old, 82-year-old book. It's a 1934 book, um, and w there is a very interesting article in this, in this book that some of you may be familiar with. If I can find it, does anybody recognize this man? His name is David Hoxie, and, and let me read a little bit about this. Uh, I'll read you just a couple of paragraphs about this because it's really interesting. Um, taking the knock out of, out of a motor that has done uh, 50,000 miles is just another job for the average mechanic, but for the man who is paying the bill, it is serious business. The woman who drives into a repair shop to have a bumper straightened feels certain that this particular job is about the most important thing that had happened in motordom in a decade. The people who pay for repair bills do not take kindly to loud talking mechanics, not to the wise cracking loafers who spend idle hours around a service station and just as our grandfathers uh, did a little loafing in the village smithy. Um, a repair shop should be operated on a real business basis with serious minded attention to the needs of the customers. These four paragraphs Sum up the philosophy of David Hoxie, General Automotive Merchant of Westerly, Rhode Island. Um, he was a hard-nosed son of a gun. If you go on and read the article, he basically talks about how he ran a successful business. And all of you know, and we've been trying to find this out, we all know that his business was operated just a few doors from here as recently as the 1990s, 2000. Um, apparently, it doesn't say where his business was at this point, but it was not in this location. Uh, we think it may have been down um, down where the uh, McQuaid's Market is down there. No. no? Yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. Okay. So you remember that there, there, it was here. Yeah. Uh, I'll leave this here. Uh, I, for, and I, I recommend you come up if you have time after the lecture to, to read this. I think it would be worthwhile. Um, also, the other thing about Motor Magazine, you'll notice the cover, and I've got another copy out there. These, these are just wonderful. Um, Art Deco. The, the covers on these were all of, of, of this area, Art Deco, and you recognize the Chrysler Airflow. A great car. A great car. So uh, they were not popular with the public, but they were an engineering marvel in their day. Uh, they only were around three or four years, uh, and boy, would I love to have one. I would love to have one. Um, and even, even in the 1930s, you look at, these, were, these are two Packards, they're 115C business, business coupes. These were the low end cars of Packard at that point. And they were a car that was manufactured in num numbers to try to save Packard. 
Also remember during the 1930s, we had a depression. 1933, 50% of the people in America were out of, bit, out of work. Uh, and there were, there were basically two classes of buyers in cars. There were people that were buying the Fords and people that were buying Packards and Duesenbergs and Peerless and, and uh, uh, Marmons and these big, big uh, salon bodied cars. They were rich people that bought custom bodied cars. Um, and the depression put an end to all that. It put most of, the, most of the manufacturers out of business also. Those 2,600 manufacturers you, you heard about uh, at the turn of the century were reduced to about 44 just before the World War II began. It went from 2,600 to 44. And after the war, even fewer. Uh, the Depression era in the 30s just put a kibosh on most of, most of the manufacturers. Um, okay. By, this is in the, the late 30s, and you can see uh, we still have running boards, we still have b balloon fenders, we have rumble seats, uh, still a little bit crude. Uh, by, by the 40s, uh, cars got a lot more streamlined, they got a lot more functional. Uh, no running boards, uh, headlights are incorporated into the fenders, no, uh, no rumble seats. They were streamlined cars. The windshields were raked back quite a bit uh, for more aer aerodynamic uh, flow. Uh, it was a total change between 1930 and 1940. Okay. And you can see Ken's car here, a 1941 car, and that, that exemplifies how streamlined the cars became. What happened? Uh, we all know what happened in December of 1941. Uh, and by January of 1941, passenger car production ceased in America. Um, many of the manufacturers went into other businesses. Uh, to, to support the war effort. Packard assembled Rolls-Royce engines for airplanes. Ford built airplanes. Studebaker um, built trucks, many of which that went to Russia. Uh, so if you see a car that's from 1930, or 1943, 1944, 1945, it wasn't made for the public, it was made for the army. There were only very few cars that were made and they were all made for the military. Okay. And that's about pre-war. I just want to say a few things, and I'll do this where I know I'm taking a lot of time. Um, I'll say this very quickly. Um, Pamela asked us to talk about classic car restoration. And I guess, I guess the first thing I would ask, if you are interested in buying a, a car, acquiring a car, the first question to ask is, why do you want it? What do you want to do with that car? Do you want a car that uh, reminds you of childhood rides with your parents? Um, and, uh, or do you want a car that uh, was one you missed because it was a, a muscle car era and you couldn't afford one? Um, do you want a car that you want to bring to shows and, and put in competition? Um, or, or do you want a car that's a, a an old car that's just a daily driver? All of those things should uh, hopefully focus you on a certain type of car that you want. And it doesn't have to be a car that's totally restored. If you look at Ken's car, he, uh, today, I, I have that Packard, but I brought a, the Chevy wagon out there. Ken brought his, his Buick. Neither one of our cars is really restored. We have a, a, a whole lot of fun with them, um, and just as the way they are. Um, uh, many of the cars that you see in our parking lot are much more lovingly cared than he and I have cared for our car, and they're, they're in wonderful condition, and they're better, near or better than new. If you're interested in restoring a car, you've got to ask yourself what you want with the car. Uh, with our cars, we spent very little money. Uh, for me, four figures, less than $10,000. Uh, if you want a car that's a show car, you undoubtedly will have to spend a lot more. If you're handy, you might be able to restore that car yourself. But if you have to pay someone, it's going to cost you significantly, significant money. That may be important to you because you want a car like Uncle Fred had and you want that same car and you want it in the same condition that he had it when, when you knew him. And you're gonna to have to pay for the restoration of that car. Um, and it's, it may cost significant amount of money. The rule of thumb with old cars and restoring old cars is, if you see a car you like, uh, it is much, generally, generally, much cheaper to buy a car that has been restored already and someone else has foot the bill for all that repair. And you're getting it maybe not when it's just been finished and it's nice and shiny, maybe get it with a few thousand miles on it and you'll save yourself a lot of money buying a car that's been restored but, but used for a while. Um, if you do have, if you must have a certain car, 
Um, it depends on what it is. If you want a, a Rambler or if you want a Corvair, for instance, you can get those, or a Chevy wagon, you can get those fairly reasonably. If you want a 57 Chevy Bel Air convertible, get the checkbook out. It's going to be over $100,000, um, unless, it's, unless it's a basket case. Um, so you really have to ask yourself what you want. If you want a station wagon, you could get a 60s vintage Rambler for probably $6,000. It will be wonderful, wonderful. Uh, mine was about $8,000. Uh, so uh, you always have to ask yourself what, what you want in that car. And when you go to look at a car, I'd recommend, and this is one of the advantages of being in a club like ours. One of our members wants to buy a car. Uh, one thing he does, he or she does in the beginning, is maybe you find one online. You generally do not want to buy a car sight unseen. There's too many hidden caveats in that car if, it's, if you buy it sight unseen. If you must do that, uh, contract a local um, appraiser in the area to look at that car for you and give you an unbiased account of what condition it's in. But if you belong to a club, you say, Ken, Don, Dave, Come on with me. We're going to go look at a car, and you've got five, you've got five or six sets of eyes, and probably a hundred years worth of experience uh, looking at that car for you. And I don't know about you folks, but when I look at a car, there's passion, uh, and sometimes that clouds appear of what you're really thinking. You don't really see things you should be seeing because you're so passionate about the car. So always bring people that know what they're doing. Um, and the last thing I'd like to say is, um, why do we like old cars? Uh, many of us, for many of us, it brings back memories. Uh, it, bring back, it brings back that time maybe when we were a child and we were out on, the, on the vacationing with our parents. It reminds us, in my case, of my sister who's passed away. Um, and, or, or it brings back an era. These cars out there are time machines. When you get behind the wheel of that car, you are brought back. Uh, you, there's the smell, the sound, uh, just the structure around you. You are brought back to that time. And I think that's why we are who we are. Uh, some of us have a sickness and it's pretty bad. And, and we absolutely are passionate and we love these cars. Uh, I'd like to hold questions and I'd like to turn it over to Ken right now. After we're done, um, then we'll, let's handle any questions you might have. Excellent. Oh, where do we go? Oh, yeah. There you go. I'm going to put this in the pocket. I'll clip you here. Yeah, I'll clip you. Okay, I'm wired up. Oh, the thing fell off. Let me see, I just clipped on there. He's really good with cars. Yeah, I'm really good with cars, right? There you go. Uh, how about the little clicker? Oh, that's over there. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Just a minute. Takes me a while. I'm used to using a mouse rather than a little finger thing on there. Or it disappear? No. Okay, so I'm doing post war, and it's, it's really a convenient division when you talk about post war. Uh, there's actually arguments about when is post war. Is post war anything after, let's say, 1945? Or is post war anything after 1941? People decide different ways of looking at it. Um, it's a nice division right around there because 40 years before, you've got almost all the cars that people collect, and 40 years after, you've got almost all the cars that people collect. So it's, it's right in the middle of time. And so I just put a little stuff on there about it. But what happened was when we finally did go into war, we bombed, it was December 7, I believe, 1941, uh, the government basically said to almost all the manufacturers in the country, and I'm not talking about just car manufacturers, they said, you're going to help out. And they actually had associations that met with the government, said, you are going to take your manufacturing and offer us something. You're going to manufacture something for the war. 
not what you were already manufacturing. So a lot of things that people got all the time, they're able to purchase, they couldn't purchase anymore because they went into the war effort. And with cars, the uh, last cars are made February 22nd, 1942. And a lot of the cars, suppose at the end of, uh, the end of 1941, you put an order in for a car. You already had your order in, you already put your deposit down, and the war happened. They weren't going to give you your car. And many, and many times what happens was the car was spoken for by the Army or by the Navy and so on. Unless you had special, special reasons why you could get it. You're a government official. You're an official uh, civil defense type official in, in your community, things like that. So a lot of things changed all of a sudden at that time. Uh, a lot of regulations they had, no cars, commercial trucks, or auto parts were made from February 42 to October 1945. Uh, most collector organizations consider anything prior to 1946 as pre-war. I did a little bit of 41 stuff here because I have a 41 car and I know a little bit about that stuff so I figured I'd put a little bit of it in here. Uh, just to give you a, a general idea of what we do cars wise, that's a little picture of a whole bunch of our cars at an event that we went to last year. And we don't just, you know, work on cars like I don't work on cars much because I'm horrible at cars. I can't do much at all. And these guys help me out. But we go places. That's a cider mill here in, in Connecticut, just over the border here. We all go there for an afternoon. We have some cider. We see how it's made. We bring up our lunch and so on. So we're not just a place, a bunch of people who are Oh, what's the name I used to use? Uh, grease heads or something like that? Grease monkeys and so on. Yeah, motor heads, right. That's not what the whole thing is. As a matter of fact, in our club, we encourage, and it's not just guys, we encourage all the men to bring their wives to everything too. So when you go to one of our meetings, there's quite a few women there, nearly almost as, as half as many women as men. So it's a, real, uh, it's a real family community type thing. And we've got cars from all areas down there. If you look way on the left, you've got cars from the 40s, the first three cars there. After that, you've got a, a, a 30 car, 1937, there's a 64 Buick. Right in the middle is a 1950 Olds, I believe, a 50 Mercury in the green way in the back. And a number of these cars are right outside here today. Uh, some of them may still be here at the moment. And over to the right there is a 37 Packard. Uh, right when the man in a blue shirt is standing, that's Bob's car. It's an absolutely immaculate, beautiful car that he has there. 48 Plymouth. That's another beautiful car. The man who brought that, he's here today too. 69 Firebird. The man who has the Firebird, he's down in Florida. Some of our, this week we lost a bunch of people. They go do the Florida thing. And that 38 Plymouth, the man who owns that is here today too. And that one's right outside with a nice rumble seat. And he'll tell you a nice story about that if you ask him. So what happened? What did these companies do during the war? They couldn't make cars for you as, a, as an ordinary person, you know, who is, um, regular ordinary customer, but they kept up the advertisement. So Ford had a big slogan, there's a Ford in your future. We can't give you a Ford now. We'll be able to give you a Ford sometime later on. So this would have been a paperweight that uh, you would get if you were a Ford dealer and you'd have it on your desk. But a lot of their advertisements put that on there. What did they do instead? They built products for the war effort and they built plenty of them. But lots, lots of advertising too. And it wasn't just the automotive industry. So here's an example. Electro Voice made uh, microphones. They may still be in business, so I'm not sure. But here's an advertising, National Geographic, see the date there. And you probably can't read the text at all. But basically, they're discussing what we're doing now. What are we doing during the war? And we're making pots for the war effort. You're not going to be able to buy these things if you're, let's say, a ham radio operator and so on. They're not going to be available for you. Buy used stuff if you want to. Uh, Helicopters Radio. They made radios for amateur radio operators, basically. And I get into this stuff because I'm an amateur radio operator too. But they stopped all amateur radio operation production. They made radios for the Army and the Navy and for the Air Force. And so if you get those old radios and look at them, you'll see plates on them indicating who made them. But there, were, there was nothing available for civilians at that time. Uh, the automobile manufacturers who were most interested in, they all did the same thing. So on the left-hand side, you see a 41 DeSoto. That's an ordinary advertisement in 41. But now when the war came, you see the Soto there, and you've got a B-26 Marader. It's an airplane, and they made parts for that airplane. All the automobile manufacturers made parts for something. Airplanes were something they did a lot of work with. Here's a company that was right down nearby in uh, Malden, Massachusetts. They made large uh, technical receivers, uh, radio receivers. They didn't make those 
anymore for ordinary people, but they did make them for the Army and the Navy, and they made the ones that, uh, the AD antennas that you see on this tank, as an example. Here's a, uh, here's a tank, it has twin V-16 engine in there. In other words, two engines, V-16s each. So you've got a total of 32, right? 32 cylinders on that to move the M5 tank. So again, they're not making luxury cars anymore. Here's, uh, here's uh, the real thing. That's an M5 similar in 1942. Uh, a lot of Jeeps were made. And you see a Jeep, you say, well, Jeeps must have been made by Jeeps. Jeeps weren't all made by, by Jeep. It was just a, a name that they gave the Jeeps in the Army. This particular Jeep, well, Jeeps are basically made originally uh, by Willys, American Bantam, but they're also made by Ford. And this happens to be a picture of the last one that Ford made before the war ended. Cadillac, again, engines for airplanes. Uh, here's an advertisement during the war by Pontiac. So on the left, they're trying to show you all the different uh, ser uh, services. And on the right, they're showing you examples of uh, things that they're making pots for. They made ammunition, they made the bullet cases, and so on, you name it. Now, when you go from 1941 to 1946, in other words, to the post-war, there's a lot of changes. Uh, all of these car manufacturers see here, they were all present before the war. But after the war, a lot of them disappeared. The ones in red pretty much all disappeared after the war. They didn't disappear right away. Some of them went as far as 1960s. I think 1964 or so for Studebaker, probably around there. Rambler was made uh, up through the 1970s, I believe. They all became incorporated in American Motors. But most of those all disappeared. They didn't make it through they, it was difficult to make it through the war because they weren't making as much money as they would have been making uh, before the war when they were selling to ordinary people, making large numbers of cars and doing what they're doing. When these people had to make cars, they had to retool completely, make new buildings, get rid of all their machinery, make new machinery, new lines. It was a total huge change for them. The uh, new car, this is, a, this is a car that came just before the war, it's a 1942 Ford. So it's one of the last ones made. So when they started making cars after the war, that'd be 1946. No cars made in 45. So let's take a look at a 46. So you look at 46, and go back to the 42. If I made the same color and had them point in the same direction, which I just wasn't able to do that, you wouldn't see any difference, all right? There's hardly any difference in them. They, they took the same cars and started making them all over again. They couldn't stop making a brand new car. It takes at least three years to introduce a new car with all new metal and so on, all different kinds of pots that they had. They were busy fighting the war and they didn't have time to do that. Here's a 47. 47 looks pretty much the same as the other one you see. So again, it took them several years to ramp up. If you're gonna buy a car in 1946, 1947, even up to 1948, you paid the sticker price or more often you paid more than the sticker price. It was a seller's market because all the men came back from the war and everybody wanted a new car. All the really old cars, really old ones, ones from the teens and 20s, most of them, they were, chained, they were brought in as scrap and they became tanks. They became bullet casings. They were just melted down and used. And so they all disappeared. So it was really difficult to get a car. And so they had you over a barrel. So you paid quite a bit for them. Studebaker was one of, the first new, one of the first companies to come out with a really new and different car in 1948. I put Tucker up there. Maybe you heard of Tuckers before. Yes. Tucker. You heard of those? Really, they were, they were new. They didn't make a whole lot of them. Guy lost his shirt. But because they were, so, they were so technically different, they became very popular and very difficult to find one now. Matter of fact, um, Bob and I are going to go on a little trek tomorrow. We're going to go to Hershey, Pennsylvania and there's a National Museum there. It's, the National Museum is, is run by the people who run our organization, Antique Automobile Club of America, and I think they still have their Tucker, they still, they, they have a Tucker administration. Turned with the exactly, it was in the middle, and then as you turn to the left, the headlight turned to the left, turned to the right, yeah. Some other companies have copied that since, too. It's not, it's been proven what we have now is actually better. They ha they're not doing it, generally speaking. Um, around this time, post-war and a little bit pre-war, manufacturers came up with what they call a division type thing. 
General Motors, they, General Motors was formed by, per, by purchasing a lot of other automakers. So you see the number of automakers there. And there's a lot of others that they purchase, and you don't see their names anymore. But they had them all made individually, like Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile. They really were different cars. But w when you got to the late 40s and the 50s, what they did was they came up body style types. So you could take a Chevrolet body, the basics of a Chevrolet body, and the basics of a Pontiac body, Oldsmobile body, and put them on top of each other, and they looked the same, if you really look carefully. What made them different was the little changes in the fenders, trim, and things like that. They might have four different Chevrolet bodies. They call them A, B, C, and D. They have four Buick bodies. They call them A, B, C, and D. And four Cadillac bodies, same thing. And they would change the engines and transmissions and other parts, and, and that's how they differed. So here's a little example. And by doing this, you could, you could have upscale and low-scale cars, what you added to them and what made them look like, and you could have a lot of different pricing points. So one of these is a Pontiac. One of these is a Chevy, all right? And I think they were, I figure which year, I'll probably put it on the next one, it's probably 1948. But if you look at them, you have to be a Chevy or a Pontiac guy to know. I think I remember, I believe the Chevy is the top one. Was I right? Yeah, that's the top one, 1946. Yes, well, if you know it, yes, because you know this, and it's hard to see. There's a little Indian right there, and he lights up. It's plastic in the front, and he lights up, yes. And you've been looking for that, things like that. When I knew that, was a, thought it was a Chevy, I'm looking at the grill. But these are the kind of things, take the grill off, take the emblem off, take this and swap it out for that, and you've got the other car, all right? And so they're very similar, but they were different cars because the engines would be totally different. The transmission is most likely totally different. All kinds of options that you could get. But the outside body, they kept them saying, this is very expensive to make these pots of the body. So they were able to reduce costs a lot well, by yeah, doing that. Straight eight. Well, straight eight. Yes, they did. And Oldsmobile had a straight eight, but it was a flat head. Yeah. Whereas Buick had a straight eight, which was an overhead valve, like you mentioned. Yep, so there were differences. But there's more internal differences. Um, GM cars, they had the A bodies. This is just talking about GM, but most of the manufacturers did things like this. They had A bodies, B, C's, and D's. And just going through, like I mentioned to you, just broke down the names of some of the car, cars that were of the same body types and so on. And this is the one I just threw up there is a Pontiac. Uh, but notice it's a streamline, they call them a streamline or a, a slope back and so on. Just going to go through a little gallery. What did cars look like between 46 and 48 in that particular period? All kinds of things. This is a Chrysler town and country. Uh, that's real wood that you see on there, the, the light colored stuff. I'm not sure if the panels were real. I think the panels in this particular one were metal. Is that correct, guys, on the, on the town and country? They were, yeah, thank you. Bob. They were wood on other ones, like on a station wagon. This is a uh, Plymouth four-door, that's one of our, when I put names on there, that's because that's the name of someone in our club who owns a particular car. And um, again, the Plymouths were kind of flat-sided, they were really deluxe inside, they are very nice, all the Chrysler cars were really nice, they put a lot of work on the inside, but not as much work on the outside. Some of the General Motors cars tried to distinguish themselves by uh, being a little more detailed on the outside. This is a really nice picture of that same car, and Tom decided that would be a really good way to take the picture. He saw this girl walking by his car. He goes, can you stand in front of my car? Actually, when I'm told, he told her to stand in front of his car so he could get the picture. So I think that enhances the car a bit. There were some cars that were really pretty new at this time. Here's a Crosley, entirely new. Crosley made a major refrigerator at one time. They might have made a fan. They might have made all, they made all kinds of things. They made, a, they made a, a baseball field, you name it. But they also made these little cars. And the Crosleys, very small, you could fit that inside sheds that a lot of you people own probably. They didn't do real well after a while though because it's a car for people who don't want to spend a lot of money on gasoline because gasoline is expensive. It wasn't expensive then. Gasoline really wasn't all that expensive post-war in the 40s. Uh, there's other types. This just came out in 1970, or 19, uh, no, sorry, 1973 or 4. When was the gas crisis we had? That's when it went a biggie. Uh, this is a, a 48 Ford Deluxe, and that's a coupe. Generally speaking, when they say coupe, usually they have only two doors rather than having uh, four doors. 
and the back seat is either no back seat whatsoever, that would be a business coupe, or a very small back seat. This is a car that I owned years ago. That was, that's a station wagon. I didn't take that one in color. That's a 47 Mercury, and that's one of my favorite people over there holding on to part of my car. That's my wife, because she's right over there. And I was so proud of that piece, and I figured it'd look even better with her there. Anybody know what part of the car that is? That's all wood. That's four pieces of wood that have been laminated and glued together. It probably weighs about 30 pounds. That's what they call a header, and that would be right up here. Mine was all destroyed, and a guy in Cleveland made this all brand new. It's a big piece of wood that goes up there, and all these slats that go across the top of your car, they attach to that, and canvas goes on the top. And on that car, the only metal in the body was the fenders. All the other parts you see there are wood. Very expensive to make. That's why you don't see those being made anymore. I've, I've been interested in cars for quite a while. I go look at them all. So if you take a look on the left, that's a 48 Mercury. And that's my daughter. And she's the one on the far right over here. And she has her, her son is older than she is there. I think she was four or five. Her son's seven now. So you know, like Bob was saying, you get it in your blood. We really like these. We think of cars as a work of art, and we also think of ourselves as caretakers. We take care of them, somebody else is going to get them someday. I mean, look at that. How could you not like a car like that? That is beautiful. 47 Buick Roadmaster. When I watch old movies, I like old movies, I look for the cars. I stop the TV and I take pictures of the cars when they're going by on the TV. So I like it that much. Watch Rain Make. Was it Rain Man with um, Dustin Hoffman? Right. Watch that beautiful car in there. I don't have that car, but at my home I do have the radio that went to that car, the exact radio. Didn't come out of that car, but it's the same one. So I think for 15 bucks I got the radio. 46 or 40, there's a Hudson. You don't hear about Hudsons anymore. They all, they all had their own features. They call these step downs. You actually step down when you walk inside, very low inside the car. So the true, really new automobiles did come out in 1949. That's when we got a lot of new cars. Uh, they're very different. Lots of different sheet metal, lots of different ideas in how they made these cars and so on. There was still high demand, but the prices had come down somewhat. And I got a bunch of statistics over there on how they looked and such. Uh, there were a lot of strange looking cars too. They wanted to get aerodynamic. And one car that I really liked, a style, was they called bathtub cars. And I'll show you that in a moment. Of course, I like Woodies. Wood station wagons, though, they started to disappear. If you notice this car, uh, it's, it's got mostly wood on there, but if it was a pre-war model, this would be all wood. There would be no metal here whatsoever. And then when you get to 49 looking at a Ford, the only wood on there is this frame. This over here is all metal. As a matter of fact, if you go, there was an automobile museum in Newport. I don't know if it's still there. They had Jackie Anassa's first car there. She had a car like this. Hers was a sportsman though, was a convertible, I believe. And these are some of the ads that they put out. It's a 49 Chrysler. Again, that'll be a beautiful driving car, extremely deluxe car. DeSoto, DeSoto's made really nice cars. Chrysler, DeSoto was, became part of Chrysler. There's a uh, Chevrolet, and very stylish. Notice with the fenders in the back, the way those are. And if you notice, it's just beginning to show a little tiny bit of a fin there. People became very into aerodynamics and into jets and so on. This is just before, just before um, we first used jets in war, in the Korean War. Other things that came out, other features, they're really getting into making cars look different on the outside. So you look at that Ford there, it's got this like bullet right in the middle. It's got huge amount of chrome on it. Chrome is extremely expensive, but they've got plenty of chrome there. There's a little comparison there the rear ends of the car, an older Ford and a new, a new Ford from the uh, 40s. There's a Mercury Coupe, 1949. It almost has, almost like having two full bumpers on the front. This became one of the most popular customizing cars ever. People would take these cars and do all kinds of things like them. That's the same car, but this is what somebody did with it. They took and they chopped off the whole roof. They brought it down. They did all kinds of stuff to make it look exactly what they, did, they wanted it. And a lot has happened in the 50s. Sometimes people don't take care of their cars. They leave them out in the field and so on. And I saw this advertisement on here. So you get the car and you get a quarter of wood for free because you got to chop the tree down to get out of there. But uh, that, that particular car is a 49 Nash. But it looks a lot better than that when you put them together. Some people like cars exactly in the raw old way they are and not repaired. That's a, uh, say, 50 Nash. 
and you probably watched the TV program that that appears on all the time. Who knows what TV program that appears on? Pickers. That's right, American Pickers. Right on the front, they love that car, and people like to get their picture taken next to it. So here's a customer, here's another customer, and she wanted to take her, have her picture taken next to it. A lot of people like old cars, and they like them in their old form, nice and rusty. Some like them really beautiful, all built up. Here's what a car like that looks like inside, though. It looks like a bathtub because they, they were getting to aerodynamics, and that actually is more aerodynamic. But take a look at the inside of that. As a matter of fact, it yeah, right, times. all the way, make a it's bed. A it's a big selling point. They even came with, uh, with a sleeping bag if you wanted to, too. All right? And supposedly, you know, this is the kind of car that you didn't want your daughter's boyfriend to take, him, take her out in because it could be used for all kinds of purposes. Well, I went to car shows all the time. You take a look there. There's one I saw here in Rhode Island. It's a 50 or 51 Nash. I couldn't quite tell. Um, that's about 1978, and that little baby, she's 39 now, right, Camille? She just, she just turned 39. Here's a nice packet, all done. You can tell the packet very easily, a lot of these anyways, because you take a look at that hood ornament on there. Is that a swan? Is that what that is? I think it's a swan, and, and it's Comrade. characteristic. Comrade. A comrade, thank you, comrade. Most cars are aftermarket. I don't know if this one was or not, but most were aftermarket. Matter of fact, I'll show you the aftermarket one. I think they were called Fultons that made most of them. You'll see a number of them. This is the one that was right nearby in, uh, I think it was, I was in Bolton, uh, Connecticut, and I saw this. I really wanted to buy this car, but I already had one in the, in the garage, you know, and I can't just say it followed me home or anything like that. But again, bathtub style, but it's a packet, really upscale compared to uh, the other one I showed you, the Nash. Nash was really nice, but they're really basic inside. You look at the dashboard, there's a few controls, not a whole lot. This thing was really super upscale. Uh, when you get into the 1950s and 60s, a lot of new things came along. A lot of stuff safety-wise, too. Sealed beam headlights came out around 1940. Eventually became, became, you had to have them. In other words, instead of having separate bulbs that you had to pull out a bulb and put a new bulb in. Nowadays, we're actually going back to new bulbs with halogen. They're going back to the old way. Uh, heaters. When you bought a car back in the 30s and the 20s, you didn't get a heater unless you asked for it. And sometimes the car dealer didn't have it. You'd have to buy it extra from somebody else. Uh, radios. They didn't appear in cars until the 1930s. They didn't appear in people's homes until 1922 or 23, and they weren't becoming common until 1924. By the 40s, most cars would have a, a radio, but you'd have to always order. They never, never came as a standard in the cars. You had to order it separately. Uh, hydraulic brakes. Hydraulic brakes are way different. Bob mentioned that from mechanical brakes. Mechanical brakes, you're actually pulling on a long wire that goes back to the, to the wheels and pulls and makes these two pieces come together. And uh, it, it, they, they can, they can fail easily. Um, power brakes, 1950s or so. Dual master cylinders, I had that on my 1964 Rambo. There's a part of your car that stops your brake, it's a hydraulic reservoir. If that thing developed a big leak all of a sudden, you could lose your brakes no matter what speed you're going at. So somebody figured out, what if we make two of these, we divide it in two. If one leaks, okay, you lose only half your brakes rather than all of them, now you can safely stop the car. All your cars have that now, but cars didn't have that. Uh, dual seat belts, American Motors, uh, Nash, which became in American Motors eventually, AMC, these are the first people to actually offer that. You think of Ramblers and such, they offer a lot of the first safety things before anyone else. Unit body construction, unless you have a truck, most of your cars don't have a big metal frame underneath them. All, all the parts are all welded together to make a car nowadays. Um, one of the ones that one of the ones that ha was really cool about that, the airflow, that did have unibody, right, Bob? That's the one that Bob would like. So if anybody happens to have a Chrysler airflow you want to get rid of cheap, see Bob, he'll probably take it off your hands. He's, he's, in, he's interested. So when you went to buy a car, here's one for 1950. It's a 1950 Chevrolet Styline, Styline, Style Line Deluxe. This is the one that my father bought right after I was born. I was born in 49. So this is what he bought. But what I want to point out, he had to pay extra for an oil filter, heater and defroster, undercoating, 
and automatic transmission. Try to buy a car without an automatic transmission nowadays. You can't buy a car without an oil filter or a heater and so on. The car that I have out there, 41, it has an oil filter on it. They didn't all come with oil filters. All right? As a matter of fact, sometimes they didn't work well and they'd, take the, they'd say, well, if it doesn't work and gets clogged up, take the oil filter off and bypass it and they'd run the whole car without them. You wouldn't think of things like that today. Rhode Island sales tax. I thought this was cool. I wish that would go back to that 1% sales tax. So my dad paid, what, $16 in sales tax and he paid almost all the money for the car up front there. That's what the car would have looked like, the car that was on that paper. I mean, it's a stylish car. This kind of car will, apply, will appeal to some people, to others it won't. So when you collect cars, you, you go after what you really like. There's a 1950 Mercury, and the owner was here today. I think the car was out here. It's an absolutely gorgeous car. And it's an example of how they, they look when you just make them, you know, the very, very best. Look at the detail on the bumper with the word Mercury and size in there. Packard did that all the time, too. Look at the cars close, and you'll see those details, things you're not likely to see uh, nowadays. Well, the jet age, 1950s, and you start seeing those fins. You don't just have an exhaust. You have this big round thing, this oval thing to have the exhaust to come out like the exhaust coming out of a jet. This wasn't by mistake. This was on purpose. Jets and such and jet airplanes, it was a big fad. It was what was going on. It was a new thing. And so you tried to, auto, automakers tried to mimic that. So fins started coming along. Cadillac was a really great one. There's a Chevy Nomad, really big on the fins. They got to be outrageous size eventually. There's the convertibles. Ford got into it. Ford never did it as crazy as everyone else. They're a little more sedate, but still quite a bit. As a Lincoln Premier, people like old cars so much, they're on our stamps. So there's a US stamp there. There's a whole series on wood cars, especially with the fins. There's a 57 Thunderbird there. Notice it's a little sedate, but 57 coming down a little bit. Edsel had it, but notice that the Edsel, they're, they're not crazy on there. The Sotos had some fantastic fins. And look at those lights on the back there. Three lights in a row on there. Double bumpers on there. If you had, to, if you had a car like that and you're restoring it and you just had to re-chrome all the chrome, what do you say, $5,000 or so for those bumpers and all that stuff? $20,000. $20,000 just to chrome. You bring it to somebody, put new chrome on it. That's all that was done if you, if you had to have that done. So if you go buy a car like Bob said, get the one somebody already paid for the chrome because you're going to pay a whole lot less. He's going to take a loss. How's that for fins? Continental kits, the uh, tires, spare tires on the outside. There's no, there's, there is no spare tire underneath there, but it was neat to make it look like there was a spare tire there. There's a, that's a gorgeous car, 1960. They're still doing it. They're starting to go where that car was out here. If you looked at the cars, it was out here today. All right, Dave Calabrese owns that. Well, how, I don't want to ignore the engines. I like the looks of engines, too. Car guys get into that. Not all engines look beautiful. I think that one on the top left, the Twin H Hudson, is one of the most gorgeous engines ever made. Nowadays, open up your car and look at the engine. They put a big cover over it. It covers everything. They call it a plenum. Well, they had things like that back then, but they didn't cover everything. Uh, there's a straight-A Buick. That's like mine. Mine is, is in raunchy condition compared to that, so I took a picture. I got a picture of someone else's there. There's a flathead eight on the upper left, Ford, uh, which I think is another really terrific engine. Lincoln V12 down at the bottom, six cylinders on a side. You want to talk about a smooth engine. Blue Flame Corvette. And people who restore these cars, they want to make the underside of the car look great too. Every single part of it, not just a little bit. I talked to a man on a club the other day. He had a 1967 Firebird. When he bought it, it had no engine. No transmission, no hood, no front fenders. You look at it, it's a beautiful car. He took every single piece off of that, restored and put every single piece back on. I'd, I'd be in a mental asylum if I had to try that. I just wouldn't even want to think about it. But he did it. DeSoto Firefly, DeSoto's beautiful engines, the Hemi engines. There's a Ford Galaxy XL500. My father had one of those. I backed it up into a hunk of cement once. He didn't talk to me for three months after that. Didn't say a word. Compact cars came around in the 1960s. The Corvair, one of the most famous ones. Really nice car in many, many respects. 
Studebakers, again, which became part of American Motors, right in there on the compact car. I think this is a lock. One of the most popular and longest lived ever, the Ford Falcon. Wonderful cars in many respects. They're highly collected because they were very stylish in many ways, too. It's a Rambler. This was, if you live in Hope Valley, you'll see this Rambler around. It's just a locally owned car. That was my first car. It was a real pain in the car, 64 Rambler. Being a kid, I didn't take good care of it, but that's from the actual picture of it. You might recognize a few others. Cars, they also get into cars that we call personal luxury cars started coming around. It's a 64 Buick, and the owner's right over here in our, in our audience. And, and the beautiful car, look at the style on the front end of that car. You don't see as much of that. You, can, you do find cars that are really super like this nowadays, but there are few. Most cars are made very similar. Look at the inside of any 10 cars, and they all look the same. It wasn't like that back then, right? This is a super luxury car. You get inside, you know you're in a really nice car. And then we have sports cars. The Chevy uh, Corvette come around uh, 19, 1953, and it's still around because they're, they're different. There's a 19, uh, that's a 60, that's 63, I believe, split window. Because that window was split into two for that year, it made it extremely rare because they didn't do that, for, I think, just for that year. And I remember a kid who wanted to get rid of one. I got one, he said, I want to get rid of it, Kenny. I didn't have a place to put it, and I would have got it for very little. You know, when you're a kid, you can't get all this stuff. When you're old like us, you can buy cars occasionally. The uh, Thunderbirds, which were so popular that they came back. They had a run for, what, was about six or seven years a, a while back, not making them anymore. But these cars were not really true sports cars. They were luxury cars. I have driven one of these. You're in a car that's so short, it feels like you're in a car that's 15 feet longer. They're just really super nice. And uh, we, have, we have those in our, in, our, um, in our group also. And they kept making them nice, but not to two-seaters, only to 1957. Here's the 63. Personal luxury car, Studebaker, still around in 63, and they made one called the Avanti, which was made for many years later in other countries and not in the United States. It's a 61 Chrysler 300G. Go buy a Chrysler now and you'll see they've got 300s and 400s and so on. They're keeping the same names from way back. These are powerful cars. Large engines, great deal of luxury, advanced options in them. Oldsmobile Tornado, which I believe was one of the first cars to have front wheel drive. Is that right, guys? Robert, Robert in 1935. Oh, yeah, right. It, that was, I should say, for the masses, for real people. But yes, it was. In, most of these things, when you get something on your car, you say, oh, that's a new doodad. It probably happened before. You've got locking steering columns. I had the same thing in my 1947 Mercury wagon. It was a bolt this big. It went right through in the column. You put your key in there and turn it, and a bolt came out, just like a huge bolt on the door in your house. It's a locking steering column. If you didn't have a key, it wasn't going to come undone. So a lot of this stuff, it, it was there before. But more often, it was in luxury cars. Nowadays, the things that you have, you have what would be considered a terrific luxury car. And you've got, you've got, a, you've got a, uh, a Toyota Corolla or something like that. That'd be luxury compared to what they had way back when. 64 Ford Mustang, very popular to this day. 67 Camaro, remember the car I told you about? The guy only had no engine and he had no transmission and no front end. That's the car, all right? He got parts all over, and it's, it's correct in every respect. That's the car, and that's what he built. And he's going to repaint that whole car all over again. I think he had paints been on it for 12 years. He's going to do it all over. We were talking about that earlier. One of the girls was talking about, I think, a 1940s car. She learned to drive on it. If you go back as long as that 67 car is the car right I learned to drive on. Oh. And it shocks me that that is now considered an empty. What happened? It, it, well, that, I think as I look around, we can all see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the car, just when they do technical, 25 years, so just subtract 25 years, and it's, it's an antique, that's what they consider anyways. So, doesn't mean desirable, but this is considered antique, like you said, but it's also a desirable car for a lot of reasons. Uh, you've probably seen a Barracuda. I remember working in Apex and loading fertilizer and stuff in the back of these cars and saying, Oh, I'd love to have one of those. You know, as a kid in college, nobody's going to buy that thing when you get out of college. Maybe. 
People don't just collect cars. They go out to license plates, road maps, postcards, brochures, you name it. You could do just that. Suppose you really want, you really like cars, but you don't want to buy a whole car. You can get these things, they're all available too. They're not expensive. We've got a few of them out here on the tables for you to look at too. So here's some license plates. That's, that's my garage. That's a little piece of my garage. I didn't want to take all the pictures. But that's some license plates. Those ones you see up in the top row there, and two on the left and right, they're actually porcelain. They're metal, on, metal, but there's porcelain on the top. A lot of companies would make them. And the porcelain uh, tends to crack and so on and break, but some people use, use them as targets and such. Very expensive to get those nowadays. Most of the stuff I buy bought years ago, and a lot of people could care less about them. Road maps, you want to talk about nice artwork, there's lots of beautiful road maps out there. I've got about a dozen or so here today. And you can see, some people collect photographs of the old service stations. Some people write books that contain just pictures of the service stations in them. Uh, if you were going to buy a Buick in the 40s, uh, or if you already bought one, the dealer would send you postcards with pictures of new cars that just came up. So there's a postcard for a 1941 Buick. How about the dealer brochures? There's a brochure for the 56 Rambler. You, all these things are available. They're really cool to look at, scan them, show them to other people, and so on. And if you're a person who restores cars or wants to know how they're supposed to be, this is where to go. This is the source for a lot of this stuff. How about driver's manual? There's a driver's manual 1941 for Rhode Island. Uh, there's a 59 Dodge driver's, uh, driver's that's not a driver's manual. That's, that's a user's manual when you buy the car. The one on the left is the one you get from the state when you get a practice to get your own license and so on. How about artwork? Now, I didn't have pictures of artwork like this. It was done locally. Bob actually does this. He takes all kinds of car parts and tools and welds them together. He makes amazing things, things you'd want to put in your living room. They look like birds. They look like bumblebees or frogs. You name it. And he's going with us to Hershey. He's going to be selling a lot of this stuff because they look really nice and he just uses his imagination. He'll take a, a light from a 1936 car and change it into a lamp. And they can be really cool. So that's another collectible item there. Anybody know what that is by any chance? Tissue exactly. Tissue hole, tissue dispenser. So you would take this, take the brackets and you'd put that on your car. Uh, I, I thought I had a picture of it, but you, and you would put a box of tissues in there so you could pull them out. It'd usually go underneath where your glove box is. Mm -hmm. How about that thing? What is that? Radio exactly. Radio. It's not fair because Bot's a professional. He, he, he knows all. He knows all this stuff. If you, didn't, if you didn't buy the radio, there always would be a hole in the dash where the radio was going. They didn't just put holes in the dash because you bought a radio. The hole's there no matter what. So if you didn't order a radio, they put a cover on it. It's a radio delete. So, and many people, probably more than half back in the 40s, did not buy radios. So you'd have a radio delete on there. I remember ads in the paper that would give the model of the car, and it'd say R&H. Radio and heater. Oh, really? Yeah, that, that, and which a big, big selling point. Car. Yeah, because a lot of them didn't have it. Yeah. Even Volkswagens back in the 60s, you get a separate heater that would run on, was it gasoline, some of them? extremely dangerous and so on, and you put that in yourself. Um, what's that thing? That's right, a bug deflector. I, I, don't know how, I don't know how well it worked, but it kind of really does look cool. What's that? A topper, yeah, you put these on top of your license plate. All kinds of things. You should get them from insurance companies. So there's one, I've got that one at home. It came with the license plate. I don't even know where the license plate is from, from what state. But AAA put out many, many, and the license plate definitely goes back to the 1920s. There's a whole bunch of toppers. So if you want to collect toppers, collect those. Put them in a frame, put them on a wall. And ask everybody to come to your house, what do you think these things are? Suicide. That's a spinner, and people did use the term suicide. This goes on your steering wheel, if you can see it. Here's one over here. You spin that wheel a little faster. Neck what? Necker's knobs. Necker's knobs. Yeah, I've heard that one too. Yes. For one hand drive. Yeah. And it was considered unsafe. In many states, they're illegal. Uh, you can buy these brand new. You can buy brand new ones with any picture you want on them. You name it. They're all, just go to eBay. eBay has just about anything you want. It's there. How about that? I got my jacket caught in one one time. That was an exciting one. Oh, gee. Like, you remember, you remember the... The movie um, 
planes, trains, and automobiles, and when John Candy got his jacket caught and he couldn't steer the car, that was a crazy one. And that's a collectible car. That's a Chrysler LeBaron convertible, gorgeous car, which I actually bought one. I put a deposit on it, and then I think Camille was pregnant at the time. We said, you know, there's another one coming. We don't have enough room. We brought the car back. So, But that's what that is. That, that, I, that's a, a sun visor. A company called Fulton, they made a whole lot of them. And one of the cars that we've had here has that on it, too. And more often than not, you purchase them aftermarket, but they made them shaped so it would fit your car. They didn't all come shaped, but a lot of them did come shaped to fit your car because it, it didn't. The problem was when you put those on there, then you couldn't see the, you couldn't see the red light. Um, the, when you, early, early cars, it was cold. Like Bob was saying, they were open cars. As a matter of fact, so a lot of the expensive cars, they put a roof only on the front and only the driver was covered. Or I'm sorry, no, it was usually the other way. Later, the drive was always open. But here they're totally open. Sometimes you get a little top on, but it would still be cold, so they put a blanket on them. And they call the blanket a robe. Then they develop what they call a robe rail, a place to put their blanket there. Now, eventually, you came along with heaters. This is my car. My car is a perfectly nice heater, big heater, underneath the seat and so on. Matter of fact, I can't turn the heater off. I got a problem with a nozzle there. The guys help me sometime. But it's got the robe rail to put your robe on. But I'll bet you that most people in the 40s, they didn't carry a blanket in the back seat and so on. They may have. Nowadays, my truck that I have, it's got a heater in the back that puts heat and air conditioning all over everybody. You think, oh, that's supposed to be there. Well, it didn't have all that stuff. There's a nice road rail there, too. Again, they kept it right in the 50s. It's a 51 Ford. They're still putting the road rail in there. How many people remember road rails? Just curious. All right. Did you know what they were? <laughs> what they were for? What did they call that big round thing? Dagmar. Dagmar. That's right, Dagmar. And you want to know how they got that, that's how they came up with a Dagmar. This gal over here, Virginia Roof, ignored Dagmar. And she had a couple Dagmars, and they started putting those on cars. I'm not, that's how they came up with the name. I'm not exactly sure that's what they were trying to imitate or not. Well, that's what I got for you. And time for questions there. Uh, some questions, Bob? Come on up here. I guess if you have any questions for either of us. I asked the owner and he didn't know either. Yeah. Charlie's Charlie's car. Yeah. The Chevrolet, the yeah. 32 Chevrolet. That would be cool though. Were, were there any other model names that yeah. were very yeah. odd? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, one of the things, uh, they often name cars after famous celebrities. Uh, there was a car that was manufactured called Rickenbacker, named after Eddie Rickenbacker. Uh, there was also a, uh, a Studebaker that came out that was called Rocky after New Rocky. So sometimes those, those uh, celebrity names got incorporated in the car. Yeah. Chevrolet and Master is the standard, isn't it? The standard will have the straight axle and the Master has the axle. For those, yeah, it was independent front suspension. Oh, okay. Suspension, yeah. Yeah. yeah what, um, what was the first manufacturer and what year did they come out with a solid windshield? Had to be right around 49, right? Yeah. I would say, right around 49. 49. And it probably would have been GM more likely than not, but that's kind of vague. Yeah. I'm sure it's on there somewhere. Yeah, it's, it's you'll, you'll notice we yeah. keep asking this man here. Yeah. Yeah. These are these are an encyclopedic resource of cars. Yeah, Bot's pretty good. Uh, have you been down to Winnipeg Road? Uh, Phil no. Sarah has an antique gas pump. Speaking of memorabilia. Phil's in our club. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay, 15 million and a price 
It was compared to the Volkswagen bus, which had a longer run in a number of years and uh, was a similar type of market. And, and I think that they sold less of that. So to me, that indicated how badly somebody wanted a car when there was a cheap car that came out, they really they could spend like half of what they would pay for a house for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to remember too, before cars, people didn't travel. Cars opened up everything to yeah. us. They allowed you to visit your neighbors or your, your family in two states away. They allowed you not to have to live next to your job. You could commute to your job. It opened up the suburbs. Mm -hmm. You could work in the city. You went home at night. Uh, it, it allowed you to travel long distances and visit national parks. Uh, it opened up America for us. It really did. The roads did it. When the good roads came along, everything changed. The perfect fit for our country because we always had open land and people expanding ever since we first moved here. So that's a perfect uh, way to do that. Uh, first, first transcontinental highway, by the way, was the Lincoln Highway. So, Times time Square, New York, all the way to California Post, 1913. The American that built the great Lincoln Highway and a freshman that built Detour. Yeah, Detour. <laughs> Very good. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's over over now. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you very much. I'd encourage you to look at some of the things we've Thank you.